Uh, my name is Philip Clay. I'm a professor of city planning at MIT. I'm the former chancellor of MIT. Uh, and among other things, I'm uh, interested in the future of higher education in Africa. Uh, that comes out of a general interest in education, but it comes particularly out of the fact that uh, over the last uh, decade or so, uh, as part of MIT's outreach, I've been involved in higher education initiatives around the world. Uh, Africa has been the less, least active part of that, and I wanted to use my time now to uh, boost that engagement. Uh, there are a number of challenges uh, as well as opportunities for STEM education in Africa. Uh, let's talk first about the um, opportunities. Many countries are recognizing that the current opportunities for economic growth are very much driven by, among other things, knowledge, research, development, entrepreneurship, uh, and whether STEM is directly involved or not, certainly the analytical aspects of STEM education are critical for being a part of that exercise. So for Africa to be a part of the emerging opportunities for this kind of economic growth, uh, STEM education is critical. There are now real benefits to STEM education, even if someone believed that that was not true in the past. Now, it was true in the past, but if there's ever any doubt, it's no longer true. Now, there are some others, but let me focus on uh, the challenges. One challenge is that as part of the very long tale of colonialism, STEM was not a part of African education. Uh, they didn't believe in it. They, in some countries, actively avoided teaching uh, uh, black students about math or science. Uh, math and science education is more expensive than other kinds of education, so I suspect there was a resource aspect to it as well. And there's an empowering aspect. When you teach somebody science, you really teach them how to ask tough questions. Ask not why things are, but what could be. So STEM education was dangerous. It was contrary to the colonial interests. Uh, and there was not left in place an infrastructure for uh, advancing ter tertiary education once colonialism ended. And so Africa is having to overcome a half century of, of being behind the curve uh, in a situation where being with STEM education is the way forward. Uh, as a practical matter, what this long tail means is that there are insufficient teachers to teach STEM fields. There's insufficient infrastructure to advance, uh, and there is a real doubt, in some cases fear. Uh, there are parents who probably say, I don't want my kids to struggle with that tough stuff. Uh, yes, it's, it's tough, but I don't know that uh, philosophy is any easier than math. Well, the question of whether there's a need for the world to turn to Africa for STEM or for other things uh, is a critical question. Uh, the answer is no, not from the world's point of view, but for Africa, it is critical that the world view Africa not as a place where resources are taken from, but a place with whom to collaborate. Um, the long tail of colonialism also means that when there are economic opportunities in Africa, the world sets itself up to deal with how to get those resources out of Africa and then have those resources processed or enhanced in some other place. I recall when I was taking a trip to Kenya once, a friend asked me to bring back some Kenyan coffee. Uh, and I said, that would be good and I'll try to get some as soon as I get there. Uh, I arrived in Kenya and I asked a friend, where could I get some Kenyan coffee? And their answer was Bloomingdale's or Starbucks that what happens in Africa, in Kenya in particular, is that the coffee beans are grown, then they are, imme they are immediately uh, sent someplace else. And the someplace else gets the economic benefit from coffee, which is a valuable worldwide commodity. So coffee is just one example, but there are lots of examples where if Africa is to be a part of the world's economy, it will have to learn and develop mechanisms by which it can capture some of the value of the valuable things that it has as resources. 
all of the cell phones we take in our pockets have resources, have components in them that originated in Africa, but the phone came from nowhere near here. Well, the question of what African leaders can do and what I might say to them uh, when I have an opportunity to meet them, um, the first is that many of them acknowledge the problem. Uh, not all of them, but many of them will acknowledge the problem. Uh, so the way I characterize it is that we have lots of people, heads of state, leaders of major corporations, international aid organizations and NGOs, all walking around the problem saying, gee, there's, there's a problem right there. Somebody ought to do something about this. What is, fill in the blank, going to do about this? Everybody's walking around. But each party feels that there's a reason why they can't take initiative. Uh, and so no one takes initiative, and the problem continues. So I think the way forward is to figure out a way where there can be a simultaneous embrace of the problem uh, and a simultaneous investment in the solution. Uh, and then we'll get somewhere. The question of what role higher education or how higher education institutions have in this uh, goes back to the answer to my last question about everybody's walking around the problem. If you ask any one of the partners, including leaders in higher education in Europe and in America, um, they will say, we would love to help. We would love to be a partner with universities in uh, Africa the way we are partners with universities in China or Latin America or the Middle East uh, or Asia. But they will say they need a reliable partner with whom to work. They need to be assured that corruption will not undo or create embarrassing or legal situations for them to become engaged. They want to be sure that there will be a way for the engagement to be mutual. Because if it's not mutual, it looks like a 21st century version of colonialism. Uh, and they want to have a plan that will allow them to have some confidence that the investment, usually of time, uh, over a period of time will, in fact, be positive. Uh, universities aren't used to everything being perfect, but they are fairly used to having things work out. Now, some of the initiatives that have been taken in Africa are encouraging. Uh, Ames is a very encouraging opportunity. The Aga Khan University in medical education is great. Uh, Asheshi University in Ghana is evidence that you can, in a very short period of time, 10 years in their case, go from zero to an outstanding institution that everyone in Ghana and around Africa can be uh, proud of. But that requires a bit of focus and it requires a bit of uh, uh, working together and leadership uh, that is all too often missing. Well, I think the uh, opportunity for a conference next year to focus on science uh, is an opportunity for uh, NEF or AIMS for uh, the various partners uh, to make a statement about what is required to move the dial on STEM education. Now part of the issue of what's in the conference is substantive. Part of it is presentation and marketing. Uh, if you publish the title STEM Education in Africa, it will get attention. So what will be the set of things that need to happen over four or five days? What are the things that need to be done in advance? And what commitments are required for follow-up that can be disclosed sooner rather than later? Would be the evidence that this is something serious. And those who have been walking around the problem in the past will say, well, I have to be there.